I would not want to wake up in the morning and be Boris Johnson. I mean, he has got, he's got a terribly difficult job to do. Um, he has had, personally, a terribly r rough time, which nobody would wish on anyone. Um, and I think you're right. I think he can still salvage it if Brexit gets done properly, but only if Brexit gets done properly. To get Brexit done. Make America great again. No, no, no. Hello, this is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Mike Graham. Mike Graham is a talk radio host and former tabloid hack. We're going to be talking all about Mike's career, Boris Johnson, coronavirus and wokeness. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. My pleasure. It's almost been a year since Boris Johnson's historic landslide victory. How would you rate his premiership so far? I mean, it does seem like a lot longer, doesn't it? I mean, it's hard to imagine, really, what last December was like, because um, I remember at Talk Radio, we spent a lot of time last year down in a tent in uh, Westminster on College Green, alongside all the other big you know, news broadcasting organisations. And there was a kind of tented village there. And suddenly, when the election came around, um, and they won this massive majority, which nobody quite foresaw. I mean, I remember coming into work on the night of the election thinking, you know, Labour might just pinch this, because that was the kind of vibe that people were getting. Um, and there was talk of big high turnouts and stuff like that, um, in London particularly. But, um, but as it turned out, you know, as far as we were concerned, it was a fantastic win for Boris Johnson. Then January came, January 31st came, there was the party in, in Westminster for that, you know, the whole sort of Nigel Farage-led Brexit party. And everything seemed great, you know. Um, it's hard to imagine even talking about it now because, you know, we, I went to a party that night where there was lots of people, you know, lots of standing close to one another, people were hugging each other. Um, and I think he was, at that point, probably one of the most popular prime ministers ever. If you imagine waking up on the morning of, uh, I think it was a Friday, the 1st of February, and everything seemed to be rosy, you know. It looked as though we had a massive majority. We'd been to this terrible kind of um, long stalemate because Theresa May just didn't have enough people to get anything done. Um, and now we were in a situation where that wasn't the case, and so he could do anything. And we were thinking, well, this will be great, because now he can stick two fingers up to Brussels, he can tell them exactly what he wants to do, and he can just get on with it. And then suddenly, um, you know, go fast forward about, what, six weeks into the middle of March, and COVID comes. And I don't think any of us really quite knew how to react to that. And I think the problem Boris has now got is that he's lost the faith of an awful lot of people who voted for him maybe for the first time, who voted Tory maybe for the first time, and who are never going to vote Tory again. A lot of them in the north of England, a lot of them in the seats that the Conservatives won, and a lot of those new MPs are only probably going to be one-term MPs, it seems to me. I want to get into the reasons why you think he's lost those voters in a moment, but first of all, let's stick on coronavirus, this awful pandemic. Mm. At the start of the pandemic, I remember listening to your show and you were sort of relatively for the restrictions. Mm and you would talk to Peter Hitchens and you'd say, no, what a load of rubbish. Yeah. And then your views sort of changed over time. Can you talk about how yeah. you perceive Well, Peter Hitchens and I ended up uh, talking for the first time on radio. We used to actually work together years ago at The Express. Um, but we had a row on Twitter, basically, because I just sort of kept, I said to him, why don't you just sit down and shut up? You don't know what you're talking about. You know, um, you have no idea what these restrictions are being brought in for. We, none of us have any idea. And for the first sort of, I would say, probably two or three months, um, I was self-isolating. My kids live in Sussex. I wasn't going down there to see them. I didn't see them for like eight weeks. And it seemed like quite a dangerous virus. It seemed like we had real things to fear from it, you know. And I was lucky enough to be able to keep coming into work, so we were still, you know, doing the show from the studio. But um, back then, I think we didn't know what we know now. And back then, we saw an awful lot of older people dying, an awful lot of older people in care homes dying. But we also were under the impression that almost anybody could get it and almost anybody could die. Um, and I think as time went on, we realised that maybe that's not quite the case. Um, and so when we got to... And so, you know, I still think the first lockdown was right. I still wouldn't go completely Peter Hitchens and, and reverse myself on that, you know. I think, we ha I think they had to do that. But I think in, a, in some sort of way... Some, I remember asking questions like, why are we not shutting the airports? Because surely if you're going to have a lockdown, you don't want people coming into the country. And it was baffled me as to why people... Were, because we, we, we were letting flights in from China, from Iran, where they had massive uh, outbreak. We're from Italy, of course, where we know where it sort of came from. And I thought, that can't be right. If you want to presumably, you know, contain something, you don't let people fly in and out of the country. So that would be the only criticism. And I think we all gave Boris and the government kind of room to manoeuvre because we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know what else to do. So... It was really only after, I suppose, um, 
July when they reopened the pubs, the, the, the mood I think started to change a little bit because people were thinking, well, if we can all go out and it doesn't seem to be affecting it because the numbers don't seem to be rising, it may or may not have been something to do with the weather. But it seemed to, to me and to lots of people at Talk Radio that, you know, maybe they're not doing the right thing here. And once they started to see the, the, the numbers going up again, we started to look more closely at the data that they were using. Um, and I think the Ferguson situation didn't help. I mean, I'm not so much Dominic Cummings. I don't think Dominic Cummings, as far as I was concerned, made any difference at all. Some people say it made them do, you know, the restrictions less. But, um, you know, I came to the conclusion, really, that it's the science that's the problem, because there isn't any. And so when they keep saying, we follow the science, you go, well, which bit of the science are you following and which bit are you not following? And that's, I think that's where the problem is. And which scientists are you listening to? Because there are a lot of scientists who think that lockdowns aren't the answer. And certainly, I mean, I talk to people now practically every day who own pubs, who own hotels, who are being absolutely devastated by, by all of this. And, and I can't imagine what they're going to do. Lots of them saying we might as well just sell up. We haven't made any money for months. I mean, it's awful. Well, this is it. And, and you have a fantastic platform to enable these people to have a voice. Mm. And I've spoken to people, you've spoken to people whose lives have been utterly destroyed. They may have had a business that they've mm. worked 30 years. Right. The whole family is reliant on this thing and it's been utterly wiped out. Mm. And these civil servants who perhaps have job, jobs for life yes. don't quite understand what it's like to feel that. So no. do you think those people are represented in the media? You mean the people that talk to the us? small businesses? They're not really, no. I mean, one of the reasons Talk Radio is being so successful at the moment is because we're really one of the few places that listens to ordinary people. I mean, I had a pub owner on today who basically said that um, he's losing £13,000 a month. He's up in Dundee. He hasn't been able to open since October the 9th in the latest lockdown in Scotland. Um, he's got people on furlough, but he himself is not getting any more money. And so he's thinking he might have to mortgage, remortgage his house. You know, but without really any idea of when he can make any money again. Because he said even if they bring us into tier two, we can't actually make any money with that. It's just hopeless. And so I don't know of any other media outlet, really, broadcasting-wise, who even talks to these people. It's as if they don't exist. It astonishes me that the effect of lockdowns on mental health, yeah. on the economy, all of this stuff, I feel like it goes under the radar in the, yeah. way, in the BBC and all these other places. I don't understand why they are so reluctant to perhaps cover one of the biggest stories you know, of our time. Yeah, I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, you see the BBC and Sky, and Sky, of course, have got their own problems at the moment with the old uh, anti-lockdown uh, presenters that they seem to have who enjoy talking about lockdown but don't enjoy actually doing it. Um, which is putting them in a pretty bad place at the moment, I would say. But the BBC, I watched the BBC News for the first time in a long time last night. And it was really not relevant to anything that I wanted to know about. You know, they did a big bit about Brexit, of course. They showed Boris Johnson arriving in Brussels, but they didn't really have anything to, to say about it. You know, basically they were kind of just because they didn't know anything. Um, then they had a big piece about climate change, you know, but there was nothing really about how the lockdown is affecting businesses, how it's affecting cities. I mean, look at Leicester, for example. Leicester has been in lockdown now for most of the year, and yet it hasn't made any difference. And you go, well, why, you keep, why do you keep doing it then? You know? Absolutely, and you've worked in journalism for a long time. Far too long, <laughs> <something> <laughs> so, okay. I don't want to age you, but... Tragically, um, I started in the 80s, um, and so, I mean, I now work with people um, who weren't even born when I was working in Fleet Street. I mean, you're probably one of them. <laughs> um, and, you know, it kind of gives you um, a very interesting outlook. I've always been very lucky because I, I was in newspapers until 2005. It's a much different atmosphere and much different business now, much harder business to, to make work, I think. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to move into radio um, after the last time I got fired, which was from The Mirror, um, up in Scotland. And I love radio. I just, you know, I never really knew uh, I would love it quite as much as I do, you know. Now, you've worked in tabloid journalism and, you know, it's not necessarily a pretty industry to work in, but I think that it does tap into... It's pretty into, brutal, I think that, I would absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and it does tap into a certain sort of psyche, I think, in the British people, or a lot of British people, millions of Brits, mm. who perhaps aren't represented in the mainstream media in terms right. of the BBC, Sky. Do you think, I mean, the BBC, let's take that as an example, they like to talk about diversity, they mm. like to talk about how they represent a modern 21st century Britain. Yeah. Do they truly represent those people who you perhaps wrote for at the Daily Mirror or the Daily Express? No, I don't think they do, because I think they think that they represent the people of this country, but actually they don't. Because the one thing about diversity at the BBC, for example, is that they're all terribly middle class. You know, everybody 
has probably had a pretty good education. They don't have very many working class people working there. It's almost impossible to get into the BBC as a journalist unless you've got a degree. You know, so they're never really, they haven't even really got any kind of good schemes for teenagers to get involved with, say from 16 or 18 or something. Um, and they have a sort of specific mindset. I mean, I've been in BBC offices and you hear the conversations that people have that work there. And they're, you know, just ridiculous. You know, they are, they have no real knowledge of what the real world is like. I mean, I would say possibly with the exception maybe of a couple of local BBC sort of, you know, platforms, but which of course there are far too many of. Um, but I imagine if you work at BBC Shropshire or something, you've probably got a better handle on what the people of Shropshire are interested in if, than if you're working in Broadcasting House in London, you know? Um, but I just think they, 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 they're very woke. They're very left-wing, effectively. They're very kind of um, prone to be a pro-European, you know, pro-EU. Um, and they, so they're all the same. And it doesn't matter what colour they are. So it's not really diverse at all, you know, because you can have a black middle-class guy, a brown middle-class woman, a white middle-class um, person um, of a, un, unsuggested binary, non-binary, whatever, and they're all kind of the same. You know, it doesn't really matter that they're different colours. It makes no difference. Now, as I said, you've worked in this industry for a while in, in both talk radio and in tabloid journalism. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about how you've seen over the years the industry changing? What's happened to, the, to newspapers and what's happened to talk radio? Well, I think what's happened to talk radio is that um, speech radio in this country has always been very underrepresented. If you go to any other sort of main, I would say, English language speaking country like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, America, they've got massive um, representation in talk radio uh, in terms of commercial radio stations. Whereas in this country, it's never really worked, partly because of the BBC. Because, for example, when I started in uh, Scotland, in uh, Talk 107 in Edinburgh, BBC Scotland is such a huge organisation. They've got like, you know, in, in, industrial numbers of people working there. They've got a massive great big building on the Clyde in Glasgow and that's not even their main headquarters. You know, they've got places all over Scotland. They've got Scottish correspondence for this, that and the other. They've got a, a, a Gaelic channel. They've got Gaelic television channel. I think they've got two other uh, uh, channels, you know. And so that kind of dwarfs anything that you can do as a commercial operation. So. There's not enough commercial. I mean, LBC, for, until Talk Radio came along, LBC was the last FM license that was given out for speech radio, and that was in 1973. So Ofcom only really encouraged music stations. You know, Ofcom are not that keen on talk radio stations because obviously they're a bit more difficult to police. You know, if you've just got a radio station playing music and occasionally somebody talking, that's pretty straightforward. But when you've got polemicists, people like me giving opinions, you know, that for Ofcom is a bit of a headache because they've got to make sure that it's all, you know, kosher as far as they're concerned. So, and I think now with the advent of YouTube and the advent of new media, as we would call it, radio is even becoming more kind of necessary because people, especially the way we're doing it now with, with videos, because the video side of what we do has really taken off, you know, we've got millions and millions and millions of views every week. Um, newspapers, on the other hand, I think have just become a little bit too, um, what's the word, I suppose, analogue uh, in a digital age because, you know, most of my friends and their kids don't really buy newspapers anymore. Certainly children, I mean, teenagers don't re really read newspapers at all. Everything's online, you know, the idea of, I actually had a friend visit me a few, um, must, have been, must have been last year actually, it was so long ago, he bought a copy of the Sunday Times which I don't buy because I've got the digital version. I read it on an iPad. And he brought, and he went up to the shop and he brought the paper and I was like, what's that? It's like this big, huge, massive newspaper, which is a great product, but, um, you know, it's very heavy, it's very bulky. Um, you know, what are you gonna do with it? Half of it you're gonna throw away because you're not gonna be able to have time to read it all. And it's just, you know, it seems to be a very old fashioned product, you know? I, I mean, I still love newspapers. I still read them every day. But do I buy them when I'm not working? No. Well, this is interesting because, and you mentioned that YouTube, the YouTube revolution is fascinating. I think yeah. that really is shaping the industry at the moment. You've taken advantage of that. Yeah. Can you talk about how that has affected the industry? How has it affected your job? Well, it's made our job very interesting indeed because we've reached an audience, for example, of people who spend all their time on YouTube who might not otherwise listen to the radio. And because we're on DAB, it's not always accessible to everybody anyway. We're not, you know, the, the Ofcom doesn't give out any FM licenses anymore. So um, there's a limit to how many people you can reach on DAB. But on YouTube, you're basically reaching all sorts of people who are interested in specific things. And the way that YouTube works is that it finds those people, finds what those people are interested in, 
and directs them to what you're doing. So, for example, if I'm doing an interview with Peter Hitchens about his uh, objections to lockdown, you might be watching something else completely different. But if it's about lockdown and somebody who's against it, they're going to point you to this. And so we've built an audience that way by knowing precisely what to kind of, uh, you know, what, how, to, how to, to, to tag it up, I suppose, if you like, so that people are, people are directed to it. And that's really important. Do you think one of the reasons that you've been so successful on YouTube and online is because, and we've talked about this earlier, the kind of woke movement has been perhaps, um, what's the right word, infecting the BBC, infecting these other mainstream news organisations, and then that's left you a bit of a gap in the market to feel, well, actually, we're going to be talking to Peter Hitchens, we're yeah. going to be talking to these other guests you perhaps wouldn't see on the BBC or right. anywhere else. Well, it's interesting because Peter Hitchens, funnily enough, has now started being invited back on the BBC because they've seen how successful uh, what we have done with him has become. And same with Neil Oliver, you know, who previously was thought of as a kind of a TV presenter of Coast. But, I mean, he's a really interesting... Um, philosopher as far as I'm concerned and we've managed to discover these kinds of personalities and because of the way we do talk radio you can have a kind of a longer form conversation and I can talk to people for 20 minutes and it doesn't feel like 20 minutes but it's a 20 minute clip on YouTube uh, then which goes you know into the hundreds of thousands I mean we've had clips going into the millions and you know not all the time not everyone does but it's a very very good way of doing it and I think the problem for the sort of the wokists if you like at the BBC is they also they don't understand the people you know, as a, as a tabloid journalist, you have to kind of know what people think and what people think is, is, is popular and what they like and what they... And people say to me all the time, you, 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 you talk about the things that I talk about. You talk about the things that I talk about in the pub and I agree with almost everything you say. You watch the BBC and you're going, why are they, why are they doing a story about climate change and doing it as if everything that they're being told by the climate change expert is true? They don't question anything because it's not allowed. You know, you can't question the fact that the climate is changing because that would be wrong. Whereas we do, you know, and we don't say it's not changing, but we also have the conversation. What would you say at the accusation or perhaps label from, let's call them the BBC mainstream media types, they would say that perhaps you and talk radio are just shock jockeys, you're just controversial. Clickbait, they call clickbait. it. Clickbait, yeah. what, what would you say to Well, I'd say we call that success, actually. It's not clickbait. People watch it and they watch it for a long time. If it was clickbait, you'd literally be getting people looking at it and then never coming back. And there's no point in doing that in any media scenario. When I was in newspapers, you didn't want people just to buy the paper one day. You wanted them to buy it three days. You wanted to buy it four days, you know? We want people to listen to talk radio and like it so that they want to come back and they want to tell their friends and then they get more people to watch it and listen to it, you know? And yeah, I mean, we get called all sorts of things. We get called racists, you know? But then that's the atmosphere we now live in. I mean, if you voted for Brexit, which I didn't, funnily enough, um, you're apparently a thick racist. And we joke about it, you know, that, you know, obviously we're all thick racists at talk radio and everyone listens is obviously thick racist, but there's a lot of us, you know, and um, I personally don't care what people call me. It doesn't really matter. I remember this great moment this year of you getting The Guardian. You may have done this a few times. Yes. And sort of tearing that up right. live on air. Now, there's a lot of journalists on Twitter are saying, you know, this is an attack on free speech. How, yeah. how would you respond to that? Well, it isn't an attack on free speech. It's me ripping up The Guardian, you know. I mean, you can still buy The Guardian. I mean, the, the, the trouble with the, the cancel culture people is that they think, oh, he's cancelling The Guardian. I'm like, well, no, I'm not cancelling it. I'm tearing it up. That's my copy of The Guardian. You can go and buy another copy of The Guardian tomorrow. Uh, or today uh, and, and, and buy it next week. It's not, I'm, I'm not saying don't read The Guardian. I'm basically just saying that this, today's edition of The Guardian is rubbish. There's a story in it which isn't true. And now I'm going to rip it up, which I call actually exercising free speech. Let's return to Boris Johnson and why he's lost those voters. I'm, I find this fascinating. Now, some people say, and I've read some polling data today, that Boris Johnson hasn't necessarily let, uh, lost a lot of people yet. Uh, he's still doing relatively well in the polls. He's back even with Keir Starmer, uh, Keir Starmer's Labour Party. Yeah. And obviously he's been through an absolutely horrendous year. Personally, he's uh, almost died almost yeah. from coronavirus. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, I say quite often, I would not want to wake up in the morning and be Boris Johnson. I mean, he has got, he's got a terribly difficult job to do. Um, he has had, personally, a terribly rough time, which nobody would wish on anyone. Um, and I think you're right. I think he can still salvage it if Brexit gets done properly, but only if Brexit gets done properly. I think people's patience has run out with him over the coronavirus and the fact that, you know, I think just looking around, you can see that people are much less likely now to do what they're told because they've had enough, you know? And it's one thing to not have much to do and to wander about and sit around outside a pub on a, on a nice sunny, you know, weekday, but not in this weather, you know, winter time is tough in Britain because it's dark, 
it's cold, it's you know damp, it's not very nice. Um, and I think that the people who voted for him in the northern seats are not seeing that Brexit's getting done the way they want it to get done. So if he doesn't do that, I think he's in a lot of trouble. So you think it, it sort of hinges on the next few weeks because obviously the Brexit deal is getting very close to that deadline of the 31st of December. Yeah. They're saying Sunday's the new deadline as to whether we have a deal. Let's say he agrees to a deal and he compromises on fishing yeah. and he compromises on the level playing field. Do you think he, he, there's no going back? That was his one thing. He had to get Brexit yeah. done. He screwed up. Well, I think given it. everything else that's going on, you know, that will be a very, very bad uh, development. If he does any kind of deal which is perceived to be weakness, because there's no reason for Britain to be in any way weak with the European Union. Britain is a very stable, very strong, you know, very potent country, right? And clearly the EU is going to be in a much worse state without Britain than with Britain. So they're the ones who are really losing out. There's nothing for us. We're not losing really anything. You know, I'm going to still buy Verve Clico champagne if I want to. I'm still going to buy a Mercedes if I want to. You know, they're not going to stop anybody from doing that. And nobody who lives and works in Europe wants that to happen either. So we're basically dealing with a bunch of bureaucrats who are miffed at the fact that we're just sticking two fingers up to them. So we should continue to stick two fingers up to them. Nigel Farage said yesterday, um, you know, the idea of going for this dinner that Boris went for last night and to try and form, form some kind of partnership is literally what you do when you're joining an organisation, not when you're leaving it, you know? So I think a lot of the people who voted for Brexit would be quite happy now for there to be no deal, and we'll see how it goes. Are you concerned about the economic impacts of a no-deal Brexit? No, not at all. Because, I mean, I've read and heard all of the same arguments for four years now. I mean, as I say, I didn't vote for Brexit, but uh, and if I had voted, which I don't do as a matter of principle, I probably would have voted Remain, probably. Um, and I did a show overnight as it was coming in and the results were coming in and we started off thinking that Remain had won and even Nigel Farage thought Remain had won. And of course in the end it looked like it was going the other way. And it was only as a result of what happened after that that I became so pro-Brexit because I was so disgusted with some of the things that were being said by the Remain kind of lobby and the warnings that they were giving out and how terrible everything was going to be. And I mean everything that they've predicted has not happened. Everything has been wrong. And so there's no reason to listen to any of their predictions anymore. They don't know anything more than, than anybody else does, right? So, you know, I see that the, the government are now saying things like, well, of course, there will be some disruption. And of course, there might be. But I mean, there was some disruption this week when stuff got stuck at ports because it happens all the time. You know, lorry drivers will tell you the M20 has lorries parked on it all the time because it just happens like that. I don't think it's going to be any worse. In your previous answer, you said something that Interesting. Gavin Williamson, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, he, he basically he said on LBC that Britain was a fantastic country mm. and we're better than France and Germany. Well, he said it in, uh, I think he said it in the House of Commons, didn't he? He may have done. Yeah. But, uh, it, uh, it, he was talking about um, why we had a vaccine before people yeah. in the European Union did. Yeah. And I thought it was telling that a lot of people on Twitter, journalists, people like that were saying, oh, how awful, you can't say these comments, yeah. you can't be nationalistic. Right. And you're just saying that Britain's a potent country yeah. or a great country. Well, why not? You know, why wouldn't you say that? Why would you? I mean, this is the trouble. I mean, there are people actively now who are on the Remain side of the argument who want it to fail, who want it to go horribly wrong, to want to be able to go, look, I told you, told you it was all going to go to, to, to hell in a handcart, you know. And they seem to be actively kind of campaigning. I guess it's a bit like, you know, people like David Gork, you know, and the Tories, like uh, Dominic, what's his face, Dominic Grieve. Some of these people actually went to Brussels, you know, to negotiate something else other than what the government was negotiating with the EU and you go what the hell are you doing you know for me that's a treasonous uh, act it's something that you're basically doing to undermine your own government and your own country in order to kind of you know I don't like to call the EU the enemy because they're not the enemy but in order to curry favor with a bunch of bureaucrats that you never even elected what do you you know what are you doing that for do you feel radicalized by Brexit um I wouldn't say radicalized no I mean it's given me um, a, a, a fantastic platform on which to build the audience that we've got. But it wasn't because it was Brexit, really. It, Brexit happened to be in the news, and so therefore I don't think any of us would have expected it to be such a dominating story as it became. I mean, last year, literally, I remember sitting down one day with John Rental from The Independent in the tent, and he sat down and I said, you know, um, I've actually run out of things to ask you. I don't know what to say. I literally didn't have a question for him because we've been doing it for so long. And we used to say back then, do you think there'll ever be a time when we just do shows that have nothing to do with Brexit? And of course, now we say, 
you think we'll ever do a show that's got nothing to do with coronavirus. So you kind of get moved by events. I mean, I was at the Express when Princess Diana died, and we had what could only be described as the most incredible, people don't like it when I say this, but I just speak it journalistically, the most incredible week that I ever worked in as a newspaper man, because it was literally non-stop. You know, I remember going in in the morning, the morning that she died, and working basically straight through seven days until the funeral, hardly sleeping, you know, just producing edition after edition after edition, magazines, you know, pull out supplements. And that was an incredibly exciting time to be a journalist, you know, and I feel the same way now about Brexit and, and in a way about coronavirus. I know that's going to sound probably um, strange to people who are not journalists, but I mean, it's what we do, you know, so you want there to be a huge story all the time. It's interesting you bring up when brought up when Dyer died because that was a time when the tabloid press came under extreme scrutiny oh, and yeah. pressure. Did you also feel it's a time to reflect not just on your you know on your own paper and your own actions because lots of people say well the reason she died was mm. because of the paparazzi chasing her and obviously unfortunately her driver was drunk as well. So did you feel that was a moment of reflection for the industry? I think it was. I think everybody had to kind of take a step back and look at what it was that, that it had become. But I, I always take issue with people who say it was the paparazzi chasing her that killed her. It wasn't. It was the fact that she was in a car, uh, which was substandard. It had previously been in a crash and it had been fixed together. It wasn't made well. The driver was drunk, as you say. He was on all sorts of pills as well. Um, and it was unfortunate that, that, that the car was speeding. But had she had proper police protection, proper rural protection, which she didn't have, um, that would never have happened. So there was a whole load of reasons why it happened. But you're right. I mean, you know, the, the, the tabloid press had become a kind of out of control beast in a way. And funnily enough, most of the people on those scooters were not British, you know, but they were photographers that were taking pictures, not just for Fleet Street, but for America, for, for magazines in Europe, in Germany, in Scandinavia, in Australia, you know, it wasn't just the British press that were chasing her, everybody was. Lots of people criticize tabloids for the reasons you've just described, for being too intrusive into people's lives, mm. especially celebrities immense amount of scrutiny in the last 10 years. Tabloids have completely changed, in my opinion, yeah. over, over the last decade, decade or so. What are your thoughts on that? When you were in the industry, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, you were at a time when the tabloids were selling the most amount mm. of newspapers they ever sold, yeah. but at the same time, um, perhaps they were too unregulated. Perhaps they were, they were being too hard. Oh, they were very powerful, no question about that. Um, and it probably did get a little bit out of hand. But I mean, most journalists that I know we're pretty what was like? Were, were you sort of in this newsroom and you sort of just thought, I'll do whatever I want, I can go out and just, I don't know, I just feel like that there must have been a very specific kind of aura in the newsroom at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was a very macho atmosphere, people would, would, would have probably described it as, although there were plenty of women working in it, um, all of whom were treated just as well uh, as the men, by the way. Uh, some of them were treated better, some of them were paid better. Um, so those people who say it was a very kind of, you know, frightening atmosphere for women to be in, well, I would say that would be wrong. Um, but there was a kind of, um, you know, the Daily Mail used to have this view that they would basically trample over everything to get what they needed. And they were relatively civilised, you know. So um, the view was that if you wanted to mess about with somebody, you could. Let's put it that way, for want of a better phrase. Um, and there were lots of things that were done, probably, that shouldn't have been done. Um, but most of them were not particularly harmful. It was a very arrogant, I mean, you were very arrogant, really, I guess, would be the way to describe it. And we would, at a minute's notice, you'd be off on a plane to Malaga or you'd be off on a plane to Hong Kong, you know, because money was no object. They were making so much money because they had so many um, papers to, uh, that they were selling. I mean, you know, when I joined the Daily Express back in 92, I think it was, they were selling like 1.8 million. Now they're down to about 300,000. You know? Did you feel sort of this euphoric, on top of the world feeling? And, and, and sometimes what comes with that, I suppose, when you're a very powerful person in a very powerful industry, mm. perhaps you would forget about the real life effects of what you're doing. And the, perhaps um, your morals and ethics might take a back seat to let's go and get the next story. Let's go and sell more newspapers. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be wrong to say that we didn't think about stuff. I mean, obviously, there were some journalists who perhaps were less ethical than others. And certainly there were some journalists that did things they should never have done. And some of them might even have done things that were illegal. But I never did that. Um, and if there was somebody that I was hounding, for example... Um, did you witness any of that yourself? In terms of what? In terms of uh, wrongdoings from journalists? And um, not really. I was doorstepping somebody once. I can't even remember who it was now. Um, 
back in the 90s. And funnily enough, it was a guy from a, a local agency. Some of the local agencies actually were worse than the papers because they were trying to get in jobs at the papers. And they sometimes thought, you know, if I can come up with some great scoop, you know, suddenly the sun will give me a job or the news of the world will give me a job or, you know, whatever. Um, and we were doorstepping some guy's house. I can't remember who it was, but it was some vaguely royal related story in a quiet street in Chiswick. And, this, and I was sort of about the only one left because the news editor wanted to punish me for some reason, so I was still there. This guy turns up from the London news agency, and I said, I don't think he's in. I've been here for like hours. I don't think there's anybody in. And he said, should we break in? And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I do it all the time. I'm like, no, absolutely not. That's not what we do. But clearly, here's a guy who had done it before, you know, um, and presumably with the view to, I don't know, taking a couple of things out of the house, finding a couple of pictures, but you know, I never saw anyone doing that and I stopped. Let's talk about Kay Burley and Beth Rigby yeah. and there was other Sky journalists as well who were recently caught breaking coronavirus rules. Mm. They, I think they went into various different restaurants. In no, they went to the Century Club, first of all, uh, which I've been to, which is a place you would only go to if you wanted to be seen. So I mean, why they went there, I don't know. They apparently then went to another restaurant where she claimed uh, she went to use the loo, but according to Guido Fawkes, they were there for two hours. Uh, they then went home to her house, supposedly. One of them apparently travelled from Manchester, which is in Tier 3. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that they shouldn't have done. Are they, are they Britain's biggest hypocrites at this point? I, I think mean, they are. They spent so much time with the Dominic Cummings scandal, yeah. berating him, berating the government. Why didn't you sack Dominic Cummings? Yeah. Asking about every single detail of every second of yeah. his trip to Durham. Right. They asked, Would you, did you stop off at the petrol station? What did you yeah. do with your kids? And yet these same people, the exact same people, were quite happy to break the rules themselves. Mm, I know. That's the point. I think, you know, many of us, we've talked about this at Talk Radio, you know, many of us think that some of these rules are a bit ridiculous, right? And many people probably don't exactly follow them to the letter. But if you're in that position and you take that view of public officials, as Beth Rigby did when she was sitting in the garden uh, with Dominic Cummings, you know, when he gave his kind of confession, and she was like, you know, how can you possibly consider it in any way tenable that you can keep your job? I mean, those were her words. She was like basically ordering him to resign in front of her. And if you're going to be that hard line, you surely have to behave as if you believe the rules are for everybody, not just for them and not you. You know, it's absolutely outrageous. Where does it put Sky in a position? I think it puts them in a very difficult position because NBC, as the owners of Sky and Comcast, uh, are American, obviously. Now, they take a very hard line. I happen to know a couple of people that work for them. They take a very hard line with the COVID restrictions because they believe they have to show an example. And also, let's not forget, I mean, Kay Burley was about to go to Coventry, or was in Coventry, I think, and her job would have been to interview the 90-year-old woman who got the first COVID vaccine, right? Now, nobody's suggesting that she's COVID positive, but it's not very clever to go out on the Saturday before that and, you know, mix with loads of people with pictures of her hugging people, you know? I mean, what is she thinking? Does she think that's acceptable? I don't think it is, you know? And I think Comcast and NBC will take a very dim view of it and they won't care about Kay Burley and who she thinks she is. They'll just go, I mean, I'll be amazed if she ever comes back. I don't want to see people fired over something like this, but I will be very surprised if she gets the breakfast show back. What do you make of GB News? Well, I haven't seen it because it's not out yet, but I think it's a good idea and I think it will be a very interesting project um, because again I think people are sick to death of what they see as the mainstream media I mean we are part of the mainstream media there's no point pretending we're not people like to think of us as not really um, but here we are sitting at News UK one of the biggest media companies in the world right um, I think having as many alternative voices is, is a good thing and I think if you have a sort of conservative lean let's not forget you know there's a reason why there's a Tory government in this country. There's a reason why Labour haven't won an election for a very, very long time. Um, and there's a reason why most people in this country are conservative with a small C and socially particularly conservative. You know, the people that you hear the most about who are the kind of the wokest who talk about, you know, having pronouns properly mentioned and calling themselves he, him and she, her, or whatever it is, and people who think that, uh, you know, uh, we're better off being part of a, a, a European Union which doesn't recognise British traditions. They're not the majority of people in this country. And so if GB News is successful, that'll be why. Has Boris got a problem there? Because I think he, this is just my view, he's more socially liberal than most of his voters. And he yeah. likes to think about 
being pro-immigration, mm-hmm. being a global country, global yeah. Britain, free trade. These are his core values as a politician, and he's always supported that. You know, and yeah. he hasn't always been necessarily a Eurosceptic. He's mm-hmm. liked the idea of a European single market and things like that before the Brexit referendum. Is that a problem for him? Because is there a divide between his views socially and his own voters? I think the problem for Boris is he doesn't really have any particularly strong convictions. I don't think he really believes in anything. You know, and we've seen that from the way that he'll flip-flop around on something. Um, and I don't just mean writing two pieces about something to, to, to figure that out. But just, you know, it seems to me that the government, if you, get, if you give the government any p- proper opposition to something they want to do, they just don't do it. And they go, all right, we won't do that then, if, if too many people don't like it. I think his problem is that um, he's also been kind of woken, if you like, by his new fiancé who's very green and is very keen on the whole green industrial revolution, which I think most people in this country could not care less about. And they certainly don't want to be paying any money through the nose for it. I mean, nobody cares about windmills in the sea and, you know, um, heat pumps in your house and, you know, renewable energy and getting rid of cars and getting rid of anything that's not electric. You know, nobody cares about that. That's not a vote winner. For Perhaps they would care when it hits their pocket. I mean, for example, fuel prices could go up. It might be really difficult for people in the lowest incomes to afford things like that. But obviously, they're well, right. prioritising yeah, the I mean, green agenda. I talk to people who drive a van for a living, right? Drive a taxi for a living. Are you really seriously going to tell me they've got to go out and buy a Tesla? Because the Prime Minister says that they're polluting the atmosphere. They couldn't give stuff. You know, they're just trying to make a living. It's hard enough to do that with, uh, under current you know, situation. People buy cars and keep it for 10 years. People in government don't seem to know these things. It's almost as if they think everybody drives around in a chauffeur-driven jack. You know, most people in this country have to pay for something and they have to keep it for quite a long time because they can't afford to buy a new one every three years, you know, and it's just absolutely not a madness. Now, you've been working, as I say, in talk radio for quite a while and you've seen sort of um, huge changes in British politics. You've seen Brexit, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, mm-hmm. the rise of wokeism and yeah. anti-wokeism, I put you in that category. So the rise and fall of Jeremy Corbyn. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that there's a sort of, we're in a, we're in a, a different age almost, post-2016, where populism has actually been able to take hold through Brexit and people's voices have finally been able Mm. to be listened to because, let's say, throughout the whole of Blair's era, maybe John Major as well, you had a very kind of elitist type people running the country, running all the cultural institutions, running the BBC, running the civil service, running the government. And finally, in 2016, they all got a rather large shock. So have you seen this kind of this, this, this huge revolution happened in 2016. Can you talk, talk about that, that change over time? Well, I wonder actually whether the revolution is in reverse now because I think people got very frightened. The establishment got very frightened by what they saw with Brexit and they couldn't quite believe it, as you say, and they couldn't quite understand it because they didn't know anyone. I mean, Rod Little talks about this and his wife and he lived down in the Shire somewhere near, um, you know, some nice part of Kent, I think. And he said, you know, um, and he was always pro-Brexit, but the day after the referendum result came out, his wife was picking up their kid from school, and she said, um, you know, they're all bewildered. All the mums are all bewildered because they don't know anyone that voted for Brexit. And he's like, well, that's because you live in a very nice leafy part of Kent where everybody thinks the world is wonderful and they've all got plenty of money and they don't see the European Union as a threat and all of those things that people really wanted to, 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 to tell the public about and tell the Prime Minister about. And I think that that scared a lot of people. And I think in a way, wokeism is a kind of reaction to that, where they've kind of gone, okay, let's circle the wagons a little bit. Let's make sure that the Nigel Farages of this world don't get anywhere. Let's make sure that, you know, it's not all about, you know, right-wing politics and populist politics. And let us make sure that things like the National Museum um, of the country, or the British Museum rather, um, gets rid of all of the statues that might be, you know, potentially harmful to people seeing. Uh, you know, let's go to the British Library and make sure that we strip out all of the horrible, nasty stuff. I mean, just around the corner from here, that Guy's Hospital, the, the statue of Thomas Guy has been, has been covered up, right? This is the guy who donated the money for the hospital to be built in the first place, and it was built for poor people. This is not a guy who was, you know, a horrible slave driver. This was a philanthropist, and yet we're not allowed to see him. And I think that's a direct result of them trying to take back some kind of control of the political sort of purposes of, of this country because they, they, they don't know what else to do. Where do you think these, these revolutions in 2016, I want to talk about Donald Trump and Brexit in that context, mm. where do you think those currents came from? Why, did, why were they, there these huge votes for these so-called populists, people who just came completely out of nowhere? And 
you know, the majority of Britain, at least, decided to vote for Brexit. I think they didn't come out of nowhere. I think they came out of something that had been going on for quite a long time. But the, the, but the people you described, like David Cameron and George Osborne, I mean, two of the worst leaders this country's ever seen, um, just had, didn't have a clue about. Because, you know, these guys are so wealthy. You know, I think George Osborne's family own a wallpaper company or something like that, you know, but they're billionaires. Same with Cameron. I mean, the only person richer than him in the house was Samantha, his wife, who had even more money than he had. And, you know, um, I don't think they paid any attention to the little guy for a very, very long time. And I think immigration was an issue for a lot of people. And I think there's no secret that a lot of people voted Brexit because they wanted to see controlled immigration. Now, you might say they were wrong and you might say they were misled even because it may not be that, uh, that immigration is going to be any different because, as you say, Boris Johnson seems less inclined to do anything about it than anyone. Um, but at the end of the day, people were unhappy, I think, with the way the country was being run, first by Tony Blair, then by David Cameron, and I think it was building. And suddenly Brexit came along, and here was an issue, and here was a party, the Brexit party, Nigel Farage, um, and the whole idea of leaving the European Union, which an awful lot of people were quite keen on for a long time. Because the European Union, let's not forget, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when we joined it, back in 1973. I mean, I wasn't that old, but I mean, I remember thinking, oh, what's this new, you know, European community thing? But it wasn't what it is now. It wasn't 27 countries all being told to have sort of the same policies on absolutely everything. It was an economic, it was a trading block, you know? And I always say to people about the EU, we never know where it's going to go next. You know, if you had voted to remain, nobody ever asked the question, well, what's going to happen if you vote for remain? You know, but they always ask the question, what's going to happen if you vote to leave? Well, this is interesting. And I want to talk about your predictions finally to, to end the interview mm. into 2021 and beyond. Are you optimistic about the new year? We've got a vaccine. We're finally, it's being... Run. Yeah, well, I mean, the vaccine's all very well. The only problem with the vaccine is it doesn't stop you getting COVID. It doesn't stop you spreading it. And it doesn't stop you self-isolating if you're told to self-isolate. So apart from that, it's great. <laughs> um, but seriously, I mean, it is good because it will supposedly stop you from getting it too seriously, which means not so many people are having to go to hospital. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm generally an optimistic person. I think that's one of the reasons we're also successful at Talk Radio is that we don't tell everybody what's terrible about life or what's awful about uh, you know, leaving the European or what terrible things are going to happen to you um, and when you wake up tomorrow morning. You know. So I think Boris Johnson will get Brexit done because I think he has to. Um, I think he'll get it done in a way which is OK for most people because the, other, the alternative is he's finished. Um, and then I think he will probably step down at some point before the next election because I don't think he's fit enough. He, I think he doesn't look great to me. He still looks as if he's struggling with his health. Um, and I can't imagine that he wants to do the job that he's always wanted because it's turned into a massive nightmare for him. Like I say, I do not want to wake up in the morning and be Boris Johnson because nothing's good at the moment. Um, what about this woke issue? Where do you see that going? I think that will disappear because I think that it's only really being driven by a very small minority of people. Most of them are very middle class, most of them are very white, most of them are very kind of um, educated, shall we say. Um, and they're not really living in the real world. And I think some of them may find themselves um, out of a job because some of the institutions that they're attached themselves to and some of the biggest, I think some of the big civil service jobs will go because there won't be enough money to pay for them all. So I think, you know, this, as, as academia shrinks, as civil service jobs shrink and as the economy kind of shrinks, which it will do for a while, I think people will have more important things to worry about than what you're calling them. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. Thank you.